One question is about your comment about uh, Dzogchen literature tending more towards aesthetics rather than logical analysis. And someone's asking specifically about the Vajra or diamond as a metaphor for Buddha nature. Maybe you could speak a little bit about that. So on the first question, I mean, definitely I'm biased because um, like I, I'm not someone who shies away from analytical thought or logical thought. I mean, it, it's actually what comes easiest for me, but I must say from a, a very early age, I was predisposed to the arts and particularly towards literary arts, poetry, um, fiction, novels, et cetera, and also other kinds of arts, visual arts, performing arts, and so forth. And so what I always kind of wondered about as a child was like, what kind of rigor is applicable in the type of experience and the type of processing we do when we read a poem, like a poem that is evocative, like Long Chempa's uh, The Chu Ying Tzu, The Treasury of the Expanse of Reality, or we read Dueno, the Dueno Elegies of Rilke, and we feel these strong sentiments. We feel like we're learning something, but it's not the kind of learning we have when we go through like a rational argumentation that puts out the grounds for our basis and, you know, goes through these formal processes and so forth. And yet to me, it felt at least, and, and for me personally, more transformative than the kind of effect that reasoned argumentation had on me. So I was always interested, how are these two relate to each other? How do they compare? And how do we, how can we understand the different kinds of rigor that apply in both of those contexts? How can logic be a transformative force for you and one that applies to contemplation, but also how can aesthetic experience be a transformative force for you? So one of the reasons that when I first picked up that Longchempa's uh, translation by Gunther and was immediately drawn to it was poetry because I was looking at the poetry. And while Gunther's translations had some issues, there was some beautiful translation of the poetry in there as well. And that appealed to me immediately. Like I recognized this is a philosophical poet or a poetic philosopher. It was someone who saw the convergence of those two together. And that's what really, I think, moves me the most is, is when philosophy and, and poetry kind of come together. Now, mm -hmm. that said, Longchempa does a lot of scholastic writing. I mean, you know, he, he, pr he produced thousands of pages of books, which I've read. And mm -hmm. even when you go back and you read the, um, those early commentaries on the 17 Tantras, I mean, those are scholastic to the nth degree. Like the, the most important Sokchen Ningtig Tantra is called the Draw Telgir, which uh, is a really complicated thing how you translate that, but I translate it as the Tantra of Unimpeded Sound. Uh, although I'm, I'm currently working with Adam Little on a very long explanation of, of how to understand that title. The commentary is 2000 pages long and it's a commentary on every single word. And it's just like, okay, first, question there's five subtopics and four subtopics and sub subtopics and etc it's a totally scholastic work so it's not that Sokchen um, literature isn't full of scholastic work and, and even often they'll go through logical argumentation and debate structures but the animating spirit of the work is really i, I think more in creative uses of literature in, in allegories and striking images and poetic turns of speech and so forth and particularly in, in exploring the etymological roots of the Tibetan language. Like, well, people often wonder, like, why do you translate things that way? Well, that's how the Tibetans understood those texts. When they ha had the word yeshe, for example, they meant primordial knowing. And they explained it that way all the time. And when they said, like, lugu gyu, which people have gotten mad at me about for little linked lambs, um, that's exactly what they understood that to mean. So like every word and every term, they were constantly deconstructing and exploring, going into flights of fancy and then coming back to the reality of a practice and so forth. They were working through the medium of Tibetan language, even as they were going through deeply experiential kinds of practices and so forth. So, so, so to me, um, in those first four centuries, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th century, poetry and uh, creative uses of literary aesthetics are what are the driving force of the tradition, even though there is a lot of scholastic literature that's explaining that tradition. So, um, and I think that for them, it was crucial to how their thinking evolved in the way that you could work with Buddha nature, this, in, this internal hidden dimension 
that we want to get at. For them, you're not going to reason your way there, but you could through you know, aesthetic uses of, of, of visual materials and literary materials and language and so forth, you could find your way there in a much better way than through reasoned argumentation. I mean, I think that's very clear, but how to explain the way that works, that's more complicated. If you look at Longchenpa's writings, they divide up his Sokchen writings, I would divide them up really coarse, coarsely into three groups. There's the scholastic writings, which are like the, um, uh, the, the Tsikdunsa and the Tekchokse, the treasury of words and meanings, the treasury of the supreme vehicle, the Sapdun Gatso, uh, the great uh, o- the ocean of profound meaning, so, and a couple of others. These are his great scholastic works. And they're just very you know, philosophical in a more conventional way. They're, they're prose oriented. There's a lot of citations. Uh, it's very complicated. It makes a lot of finely tuned nuances. And then you have his other writings in the so-called Ningtik Yapshi or the four-part uh, Ningtik corpus. And some of those are the scholastic works, but the other parts are more practice oriented. And so they provide a lot of detail about like, here's the history of the tradition. Here's the sadhana. Here's how you do this practice. Here's more background information for how you do tugel, et cetera, et cetera. And then the really great works of, 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 um, of Longchenpa's life, I think, I'm personal bias, are the poetic works, poetic works of philosophy. And those are the Chuyingse and the Neilukse in his seven treasuries, the treasury of the expansive reality, the treasury of the abiding reality, and the uh, poetic root verses of the Nelso Korsum, the trilogy of relaxation, and the Rangdral Korsum, the trilogy of self-freedom, which are just like mind-blowing, exquisite works of poetry. But they're they're works that are totally rigorous. I mean, the 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 way in which language is used and thought and experience is threaded throughout those is just phenomenal. And, and while the scholastic works are super interesting to a person like me, who's you know interested in all the details of everything, I mean, I think those works are far more powerful and, and have been more influential on Tibetans over time. The Vajra as a metaphor for Buddha nature, um, that's pretty clear in the Tsokchen Ningtik tradition. Uh, it, it's most clearly expressed it in terms of the um, like, oh, sorry, what is it? Like uh, the Wusel Dorje Ningpo, is, is that what it is? Like the, 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 the nucleus or the core of the radiant adamantine reality. Um, mm-hmm. That's a key expression in the tradition from the beginning. And that really is, a, is another way of expressing, of being expressed as Buddha nature. Now, if you look in the treasury of the words and meanings, the third chapter is about Buddha nature. So, the most famous scholastic structuring of Tsokchen thought is the so-called 11 topics. And those 11 topics are said to be the 11 topics of the Wusel Dorje Ningpo, the, the, the Vajra luminous, the luminous Vajra core. So what, what's the, uh, the 11 topics of that? It's the ground, it's the strain from the ground, which is the formation of samsara. It's the pervasion of human existence by Buddha nature, that's the third topic. And then the other topics go into the other stuff. But that third topic, when you look at how he talks about it, that's where he cites classical Buddha nature scriptures. That's where he cites the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra, the uh, Uttara Tantra, et cetera. And he uses, he gives those classic Buddha nature allegories that come from Indian uh, literature. And it looks very conventional. Um, And in many ways it is conventional, but the thing is, that's only the third chapter. He's really just kind of pointing out how this relates to Mahayana Buddha nature thought. The entire book is about Buddha nature, not just that one chapter where he talks about the Tathagata Garbha and quotes the classic Indian literature on it. So, and the way he frames it at the beginning is it's about the Vajra, the, the luminous Vajra um, essence or the luminous Vajra core, which is again, the Tsokchen Nintik understanding of the Tathagata Garbha or the Buddha nature. So in terms of, I think the question was asking about a broader history of that, that I couldn't answer. I mean, I'm not sure like when in Indian literature, where there are places where the Vajra is um, given explicitly as, uh, as, a, as a euphism or a simile or um, uh, just another term for Buddha nature. I, I don't know that answer, um, but I do know that in the 11th century in the Tsokchen Ningtik, it, it's very explicit.